If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. We have Admiral Angel Sutherland with us and you all asked for him to be back and now he's here and he's going to answer a lot of questions you left as good as he can. Thank you for that. We really appreciate questions. And also, uh, we're going to talk about the names of the ships of the Navy, the vessels, because I have a dream. And my dream is that every single South African, if I wake you up in the middle of the night, you better be able to tell me the names of all the ships. You don't have to tell me their weapon systems, but if you can, I'll be most grateful. But at least I want to know the names of the ships and I want to know where they come from and what they stand for. And that's my dream. Admiral, you are so welcome here. Happy New Year. I'm glad that you um, are over the COVID. The two of us are still coughing a bit, but, but we're good. And uh, over to you, sir. Okay, you're just going to test my memory on trying to remember all my ship's names, but fine. First, thank you. Um, unfortunately, as I said, I can't answer on YouTube. I'm not clever enough to connect up. So I've looked at some of the questions and a chap called HS asked us to talk a little bit about the South African and non-South African traditions of the Navy for New Sailors. That's a pretty broad thing, but it is an interesting question. The South Africa tradition, naval traditions, are basically the same as the, the Royal Navy. It's very similar, one or two different things. You've got to bear in mind that all services, Army, Air Force, and Navy, have their traditions and customs. But naval traditions are slightly different because we're an international Unlike the armies and air forces which work in national area, we work, operate in international seas. And we bump into each other at sea, not figur figuratively, not literally. And we meet and pass in the night. So we've got a very shared culture, a naval culture, which gives us similar traditions. Um, we're particularly close to the Royal Navy. And so I'm going to cover mainly some of their traditions for you. And one of the traditions is that ships are preferably named. Uh, and they named for various reasons, which we'll discuss later. But ships are always referred to in the Royal or the Commonwealth Navies as a sheep. Other navies refer to a ship as an inanimate object, which is rather funny, but unlike the, the army units, I would never be called lady by name or as she's, because they are inanimate objects. But don't forget, when you serve in a ship, it's alive, it breathes. I know when I was at sea, as a, especially if everything went quiet, I couldn't sleep because the ship wasn't alive. Okay, to cut it um, short, when the ships are at sea, we work in what we call watches. You've always got to have someone when a ship is moving at sea or even at anchor, someone keeping an eye out. So we divide, traditionally we divide every 24 hour day into six watches. Each watch is four hours, which means you've got four hours on the bridge, in the engine room or in the ops room, uh, and after four hours, you start tapering off. So you get relieved. And then you have, technically, you have eight hours off to go and eat, shower when you've got water on board, relax and sleep. And it works very well. Um, of course, there's always somebody manning operational spaces. But just to give you some idea, the watches are very simple. The first watch is the, it's called the first watch is from 2000 at night until midnight. In fact, we refer to 2359. This is followed by the middle watch or the black watch, which is from 0001 to 4 o'clock. And then uh, after that, you've got the morning watch, which is normally when the navigator gets up to take the stars, 1 to 800. Then we have the forenoon, which is the one before lunch, and the afternoon. Then we have the evening watch, the sixth watch, which is actually more interesting because it is actually subdivided in the Royal Navy and in most navies into two dog watches, each of two hours, the first and the last dog watch. The reason there is, if you don't have a break in your system, you'll be on the same time every day continuously. So this way you suddenly have a six hour gap, but you change in sequence, so you fall back in your watches. And it's interesting, they are called uh, first and last. It's not a first and second. So they're the big break. Now watches were traditionally signaled by the ringing of a bell. That's where your ship's bell came in. The idea being that um, it, it was fairly basic is that the 
first watch, the watch was signaled by eight bells. So eight bells doesn't mean eight o'clock. Eight bells could be any of those beginning of a four-hour watch. So it's midnight, 0400, 0800, etc. And thereafter, every half hour, don't forget, very few sailors had watches in those days and you couldn't see anyway. So at half past the uh, time, one bell, an hour after the watch changed, two bells, three, and it went on until you get back to eight bells, which was the end of your watch again. The interesting difference, of course, is in the Royal Navy and Commonwealth Navies, in the dog watches, when you got to 1800, 1830, you did not give a five bell ring, you gave a one. And the reason is quite simple. It dates back from the, bat, the mutiny at the, at the north, when the signal for the mutineers to start was five bells. And it just became a tradition. So five bells is not drunk at that time. Uh, it's fallen away in some navies. I know some of our ships don't do it anymore. Very few do it. But it's, a, it's an interesting um, uh, concept and a reason which gives you a tradition. The ship's bell, of course, is also, even to this day, a very important factor because it's used when not used for ceremonial. And don't forget, we no longer ring the bells during the watches. It's rung for colors, sunset, and during the day at certain times. But it remains a safety feature on board ship because when you're at anchor in fog, you have to vigorously ring the bell at certain times. And it's an interesting concept because that sound travels because don't forget fog means no wind and heavy mist, which means the sound travels. And it's when you're at anchor, you can hear ships around you on this. Okay. Then um, the other interesting thing is the uh, communications at sea. In the old days of sailing ships, you, when people were working the masks and the rigging, and in fact, I experienced that personally, as you know, is in heavy wind, when you're up there, you can't hear orders shouted from below. But don't forget, these masts were high. We're talking of 40 meters, 50 meters in some massive ships. So the Navy has for many years had a thing called the bosun's call. Other people call it the bosun's pipe or the bosun's whistle. And it's, it's an instrument which has been around for many years. It's got a curved bowl and you pipe on it. Unfortunately, I didn't think of bringing one now. But that used to be a sign of authority as well because it was used to very shrill whistle. And this is used to give orders at sea. And you can hear it up there. No matter what the wind is, you can always hear the piercing. Because it's a case of a bow, and by controlling the air in, you get a high and a low note, but a very shrill note. And this is another tradition because even though we can now have internal communications, you no longer have to pipe. For example, doing rounds, they used to pipe ahead of the person. We still do it. So the pipe is still now more a ceremonial thing. And it's quite important. It's ceremonial. For example, when the officer commanding a ship or one of your own ships or a foreign officer comes on board your ship, you pipe him on board. Uh, they go, when he comes on and off. And it, it's always done. Similarly, ships passing at sea, it's tradition that the junior ship or we'll pipe the senior ship, salute the senior ship, in which case the senior ship pipes the still, everyone stands to attention, they salute, they pipe the still in the senior ship, and the same thing happens, but he carries on and then you carry on. So it's very much ingrained in international tradition. Um, another interesting thing, which is a different to the, to the military, regiments and squadrons, seniority comes by their age, by their formation also within their own formations too. The Navy is different. The Navy, the seniority of a ship, because ships rotate continuously in and out, get decommissioned. The ship's seniority is the seniority of the officer command. So in the Navy, we traditionally have a thing called the Naval List, which has a number of functions because the first thing is it gives every officer seniority in the Navy. His year, rank, year, and the month. And it's sometimes hard for to have to be above somebody else in the list makes you automatically senior, even if you got promoted together. So that's another uh, interesting tradition in the Navy. Then finally, one which everybody will know about is gunsuits. 
the, the gun salutes, 21 gun salutes and things, all originate from naval practice. In the old days, when a ship, ship of war came into a harbor, and it was peaceful intention, of course, what they would do is they'd discharge their guns to sea, show the people ashore, it'll take them time to reload so they're not a big threat now. Uh, as a courtesy, the shore battery would then fire their guns. And it's an interesting thing. Initially, the ships had seven guns to the side, so they fired seven guns. The shore battery would give three times that, 21 guns back. And over age, that has now become the traditional national salute. But don't forget, in the Navy, we also have salutes for senior officers, and they normally 7, 11, 13, depending on rank, depending on the occasion. So that's another tradition of the Navy. Whenever a foreign ship comes to Simonstown, uh, if it's a, it's a formal visit, as they approach, they fire the 21 gun salute and we fire back. And it's, it's exactly five seconds between shots and everybody will sit and watch them. But of course, the traditional way of doing it and another naval tradition, is the gunnery officer stands there and he says, fire one. And as it goes off, he says, if I wasn't a gunner, I wouldn't be here. Fire two wasn't a gunner and just by this you get into a rhythm and it's it's a lovely old tradition which we still carry on to this day so that covers i think um a lot of our things there but i did search to try and find out if there was one tradition in the south african navy which was slightly different and all i got was a rather funny one but it's interesting in the old days when you joined a strike raft <laughs> At some stage, they'd normally throw you into the sea. If you were clever, you, you avoided them in Durban because there were sharks used to be in, in Durban waters. But uh, it's a tradition which I don't know if it's going to carry on. It was one of those quirky things. However, I know when I was made uh, commander of my ship and I got back on board, I was thrown over the side. So that hopefully will answer some of the, the uh, first questions. Then we've got a Stephen Short who would like to know where I got my nickname from. I'm not going to make a long story here. I used to have the ability to look very innocent when confronted. Started when I was to whistle in class at school until somebody sneaked up behind me and saw me whistling without, heard me whistling, clapped me and he said something about having an angel face. That kind of stuck. I joined the Navy and unfortunately someone remembered me from a Sea Scout camp and that became it again. So there you, you have it. Then we had somebody from Info Swiss Oil, interesting enough, who served on Reicher, and he mentioned that they didn't even have a shower on board. Uh, interesting enough, the SDBs, they are Ford class, uh, inshore uh, anti submarine vessels, they didn't have a shower except for HMS or SAS Harlem, which became an, an inshore survey vessel, which had a shower fitted especially for that. But you've got to bear in mind the ships were never designed to go to sea for more than about 36 hours. They protected British harbors. The fact that we used them for longer stories, etc. But I also believe the English in the old days, they didn't need to shower that often, so they didn't need to shower as much, but be that as it may. Um, and just to answer his question about Commander Singleton being head of the dockyard, I'm afraid not. I knew Commander Singleton, Paul Singleton, very well. He was a staff officer. Uh, but he was the logistics of the engineer at the mine-sweeping base for the reserve shop. Sadly, he's long passed on. Then um, I also had a question from Charles Manning. Did Strikecraft have naval divers on board to handle nets, etc.? cetera? Um, somebody else asked a similar question at some stage of me. And interesting enough, no, we did not have any posts for divers per se. Although, uh, as he correctly says, it would be a waste of dedicated divers. But don't forget the South African Navy also had ship's divers. Ship's divers. These were divers who, over and above their normal job, could do basic diving. The idea being that they could go down and do repairs, do little things, do check for, for bombs and things like that in harbor. So it did the very basic diving. You're only down to 10 meters, if I remember correctly. Uh, very useful because when I was in minesweepers, we at a time where I had to go underwater, put my head underwater and clear something from our propeller. I really wished we had a ship's diver then. The, however, I can tell you one story, um, and it did arise from the operations, that when we did our very first operation on the West Coast, Operation Amazon, and it's interesting here that 
oh, Charles Manning does say one of his cousins was in a strike draft. He was a captain, etc. And I think he's referring to the man I'm talking about. Because on Operation Amazon and the preparations for it, it was our first operation where we were going to go very close into an open coast with a potential threat. And the CTG at that stage for the ships was Commander M.A. Rennie. And he was not just OC of the strike draft, but he was a very, very competent and proven that clearance diver, which is the highest diver you get in the naval terms. And he qualified in the UK and actually took part in uh, the arming of devices, which they didn't normally allow others to do. And Andrew Rennie was the captain of the senior ship. And he very, in our meetings, he said that's his biggest concern because we, one of the preparations was we knew how to, we could tow each other out. He said he'd rather not have to tow. So he, on his ship, his second in command was also a qualified diver and he had one other diver. So as part of our preparations, very cleverly and carefully, he checked that all three of them were up to date. He had them check, and luckily the XO was the uh, also the other diver, and he was in on a bit of the operation, so he knew enough to make sure that all the equipment was right. They had also special equipment on board, and the plan was that any event, they would do it. And he made a comment about, I wouldn't toss the captain overboard. In a case like that, don't forget you'll have two divers over, one supervising, I'm quite sure the captain would supervise, but he would have seen his exo go over the side. It was rather interesting and we never didn't feel we had to repeat that because we realized that we could rather do the towing and we would avoid the net. Uh, other than in Karasluk, unfortunately, we did. So, yes, we were aware of it. Uh, we sometimes had odd divers on board who could do it, but it was no longer a priority because we felt we were overreacting. Then Philip Engelbrecht asked um, about questioned whether we were planning to build nuclear submarines some years ago. No, we weren't. Um, we, we did, and it's become known now. We did acquire plans for a, a certain type of submarine, but it's a diesel electric submarine, and we did a lot of progress on it. I was not party to that whatsoever. It was a very well-kept secret. In fact, if you even heard a rumor about it, you forgot it on the spot. But I do believe, because he asked how many submarines it would have been, standard replacements for the Daphnis. If I can say something rather interesting, is that I was in defense intelligence. I was the naval functionary there, so I was SSO Navy. And I got approached by technical division who came to me very hush-hush and said, have I got $10,000 for someone who's going to give them some very valuable intelligence? And I said, well, what is this intelligence? And they explained to me that they've got an American who says he can give us all sorts of plans for nuclear submarines. I told him exactly where he was going to put his plans because there was no way we were going to pay any money for anything which we did not really need it for. So that might have started it. And as Philip has also said, he believes there were some officers that were against it. Yes, there were a lot of traditional traditionalists from the past, etc., and for good reason. We had been an anti-submarine navy for so many years. The submarines was the first inkling that we were becoming and we were going to have a potential threat to the enemy as opposed to just being an offensive navy. And they felt that should we get these ships, we won't, won't get bigger anti-submarine ships. And since a lot of us, I've been one, were anti-submarine officers, some didn't like the idea, but most accepted it. Some didn't, but still, it still worked. And I realized that afterwards. Another quite important question, he says that exercise Marcus Fontaine, strand blew up in the late 80s, were preparations for a big attack on Namib. Actually, they weren't. They were exercises. But he goes on to say, were they a bluff or the real thing? Interesting enough, amongst the contingency plans, uh, we did have the contingency plan if needed, if we were attacked, if they crossed the border into then Southwest Africa, we would be able to cut off their logistic surprise by landing a small force, parabats, naval marines, and with support at Namib, which would block off their harbor. Marcus Fontaine was testing this ability in, at that time in Balfour's Bay, and it was quite a magnificent exercise because they did all the stuff and was obviously seen and reported. 
and it was based on a plan, but not quite. The exercise was a great success. Uh, most of us attribute the, the inclination of the Cubans to come back to the table because they realized we had a capability they had not realized. Up until then, our amphibious capability was not known. We had a tanker, which we converted to carry stuff. And all of a sudden, we threw in everything we had, helicopters, stuff like that. And so it was a, a success. It was an exercise, but it certainly was an eye-opener. And we fired missiles and everything. He further goes on to ask what would have happened if we'd done it, Russian threat. I think one must be very careful. Ships don't just open fire on each other normally very easily. Uh, I don't think the Russians would have tried anything. If we had strike craft there with all our ability. And of course, the traditional submarine. We had, sub we had a submarine in the force. It wouldn't have, but we didn't need to do it. It's all theoretical. But I think we assessed that they were not likely to react in the short time. Don't forget, to get a force of ships from Russia it takes weeks. Oh, I say weeks, two weeks at least. So you would have had that play. Then, sorry, uh, our last question. Um, a question asked if we had an open checkbook, Chief of the Navy, what would we get? <laughs> That's a very philosophical question. All I can say is the only thing I would make sure we, we got more OPVs, but uh, we don't have open checkbooks, so it's I don't think we can actually um, suggest that. And the last question was, how would we carry out Operation Cash Lock today with more satellites, et cetera? I personally wouldn't. But of course, submarines are always there. So I hope that answers the questions. Apparently are in there, all of them. So I don't know if there's anything I've left out there. No, we answered the questions, but sir, I have a question myself. My late wife crossed the equator. Is that the thing in the middle of the earth? Right, but, yep. Yes. And there was a there was a tradition on that specific aircraft carrier. We, we um, sort of bathed him. It, it was like a king or something there. <laughs> and then, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, that's not just on that aircraft carrier. That is an international uh, maritime tradition. When you cross the line, you have a crossing of the line ceremony. And basically, before you get there, you get informed by someone who comes on board, the messenger from King Neptune and his queen, to advise you you're crossing it, and you better find out all the guys that haven't done it before. Uh, I've, I used to remember all the stuff, but you've got bears, policemen, and when you cross the line, all those who haven't done it before and sometimes those who've done it before that don't like you for a reason, get called before the king, where they get sentenced to some punishment. And then normally we rig a swimming pool or a thing with water in it, and we smear treacle and polish all over you, break eggs over you, and then dump you into the water. And you then get a certificate. And it's, it's a lovely certificate. I mean, Union Castle have done it for years. Many people, anyone who crossed there would have one of these things, and it's, it's quite an achievement. And they're quite collectible, and I collect them. I've got quite a few. So, oh yes, it's uh, there are all sorts of names for people, and it's it's fun. I don't remember anyone being hurt. Seems like great fun to me. But then I have a question: So, what is an admiral's flag? Admiral's flag. Okay, the navy flags are very important. Uh, it also indicates seniority. So. You have flags for every flag rank. Uh, it's basically for the admiral in charge, so you know which ship is the flagship, which one will give the orders, etc. And the South African Navy ones are based on the Royal Navy. Uh, basically, the Royal Navy have a white ensign, a white flag with a red cross. We, in fact, have a white with a green cross. And in fact, I wish I could show you. I, I can turn this to show you what they used to look like, but. The, the flag depends on the rank. A full admiral just has a green cross. A vice admiral has one green ball in one of the quadrants. A rear admiral has two. And the rear admiral junior grade was the equivalent of the old Commodore, and he had a broad pennant, which is a, the same flag, but it's a pennant, swallow edged pennant. 
So that indicates he's right. Just an interesting thing is that with the changes in organization in South Africa, we started having smaller groups which don't require admirals or commodores in charge. And so we developed what we call a CTG's flag, which is, a, I designed it some years ago. It's a pennant as well, but with a green edge with a white, and that is flown by the senior officer, normally a captain. It just distinguishes which ship has the task force commander on board. So it's a, they've flown at stations, but you, he's got to be either a flag station or on board a ship. But that flag so goes with him. If he should transfer ship for, for whatever reason, that ship becomes a flagship. No, and that ship. And his pennant goes up at that side now. No, they'll, they'll have one on board. The moment he steps on board, that goes up. So it's, it's in most navies have it. But now I wish to know, do we still get something called the flag captain? Look, the flag captain is merely the assistant, personal assistant to the chief of the Navy. So we, we've always had a flag captain. He handles and runs the chief, chief of the Navy's office. He's got a flag lieutenant, who's the man that wanders around with people. What do you call them? I keep forgetting them. I used to carry them myself when I was an attache. Uh, and he's a ceremonial and he does, controls the, stop, the drivers and things like that. The flag captain is a very important one. He's the link between the, cap, the, the admiral and the Navy in many ways. No, I find this extremely fascinating. To me, this is just the best ever. But before we start talking about ships' names, these people who say that when you change a ship's name, you're looking for trouble. It's like getting a woman aboard. Is, is that true? No. It merely depends what you change it to. You see, there are cases in which you can improve the name by changing it. But I will tell you that ships do, and I can give you examples now, people grow very attached to names they never thought they would. Ships' names, I mean, the Royal Navy's got better examples than us. And I, I was just looking at their ships' names. And it's interesting that the Royal Navy, one of its unique ships was HMS Pantaloon. Now, pantaloon, if you know, is a lady's knickers or balloon underwear. So that must have been very embarrassing. But the, the choice of the name came from a character in the 17th century fiction called Pantaloon. And by coincidence, he had a manservant called Clown. And they had a clown class as well. So when you serve in HMS Clown, you obviously get referred to as a bunch of clowns. Or on Pantaloon as, oh, you're in a woman's pants, are you? Uh, other names which they've had, which they, we could have changed happily, was HMS Lucifer. Now, that dated from years ago because Lucifer is, the, is the, the fire. I don't know if you know that they referred to matches as Lucifer because it makes fire. So the original fire ships, one of them was called Lucifer because he was used to burn up the enemy fleet. And the last Lucifer, in fact, was a destroyer. But they decided after that it didn't work well. And then, of course, my classic that I would not like to have served on board was HMS Ferry. Um, they had all sorts of them, Goblin, Ferry, etc. Uh, but next one, of course, is the Flower Class. And HMS Pansy was another one. But changing that name would have been an improvement. So, so women serving on ships, yes, there were those beliefs. Uh, but the funny thing is we called our ships women. Even no, SAS, Jan no. van Riebeck, was called She. It's a ship is a sheep. Call it what you want. I have to say, when I, when I uttered those words, I could actually see her frowning at me. She was not amused at that question, but I had to ask it. <laughs> Admiral, would you say that the Navy is probably the most traditional of services? Yes, I think I would. Um, basically, the Navy goes back longer than armies. Not in South Africa, of course, but navies have been around for a long time. Armies were rather restricted because they didn't have great big transport ships in those days. So small armies went across, and yes, uh, though, of course, the Vikings taught, taught you all a lesson. Uh, I see myself as a Viking still. And they would raid and pilfer, et cetera. But once again, the only way you could do it was with the Navy. So it's, it was one of those things. 
Now, there's a great feeling of pride in me when I see the South African Navy vessels. There's something magic about them. And now we can speak to the man who actually was involved in naming them. So I would love to hear why did you get to those names and, and what was the fights behind the scenes? There must have been a few. Okay, first of all, naming is, is, is quite a serious thing. It's, and it's, a, it's politically uh, important. In South Africa, the, the, our names of ships, the original three ships we got, this is back in 1922. Because just out of interest, sake, South African Navy turns 100 on the 1st of April this year. Our first ships were SAS Immortel and SAS uh, Sonneblom, which were two Admiralty class trawler minesweepers from the First World War, and HMSAS, uh, sorry, HMSAS, HMSAS Protea, which was our first, she was a corvette from the war, but converted into a hydrographic vessel. And those names came, I presume, from, we're not sure. But the, after those ships were handed back, we were a Navy without a ship. Came World War II, and we basically took up ships from the train. Turge and various types of trawlers, whalers, etc. And most of them just changed their name to HMSAS. They were commissioned. Uh, four went down, so we lost four ships to enemy action during the war. Uh, so it's honorable. But the first time we got our own dedicated warships was when we got our first three frigates, which were given to us by the British as a reward for all we've done. And the first one, of course, was named uh, HMS Good Hope, HMSAS Good Hope. And I happened to know that they informed, the decision was taken by the Defence Force, and they informed the city of uh, the administrator of the Cape. And he actually had a, a fascinating badge illegal badge using the insignia carved out, which was present when the ship was commissioned, and I now have it in my collection. So they got the permission from the Cape. The second one was named Natal, and she's the famous ship which holds a world record in that four and a half hours after sailing on her first the delivery voyage to go and start doing her training, she sank a German submarine. Uh, the third was HMS AS Transvaal, and she commissioned just at the end of the war. So those are the original ones. Thereafter, they, I believe the Simon van der Stel Foundation was used as a consultative device. And the next two ships we got were the two mine, hunt, mine, mine sweepers, which became known as Peter Maritzburg and um, Bloemfontein. Now, what is actually very interesting is that, and it was only realized recently, was that initially they were going to be called Bloemfontein and Cape Town, in fact, Carpstop. And they even went so far as to make the name, name tallies for them, which is how we discovered this. But then they decided, no, they were going to call it Peter Maritzburg and Bloemfontein. And that was once again a government decision. In fact, it's interesting, they initially called it Maritzburg. The reason being that Peter Maritzburg around the Cape River would have been too much. And so she came out, the first ones were HMSS Maritzburg. However, the city of Peter Maritzburg, to great exception, the Navy had to bow down and got cap ribbons which start over here and end up over here. The, the next ships uh, were the town class. These were the minesweepers, and they were named after towns. So there was always some system of naming them. The Ford class SDBs, Reicher, Gelderland, Harlem, etc., were named after ships which had from other nations which had taken part. Gelderland, for example, was the cruise that took Paul Kruger. So at this stage, we're now seeing the influence of the Simon Van Stel Foundation. Anyway, the next class of ships we got was interesting because that was called SAS, it was the SAS Freistart, we changed. And she was a converted destroyer, but she now made up the fourth province. So we had Natal, Free State, Good Hope, and uh, Transvaal. Finally, we got our first three frigates. And once again, the Simon van der Stel did us proud by giving us the names of the presidents from the republics. You've got to bear in mind the government at the time and the sentiment at the time was very Republican. So this is now when we became a republic. 
Tafelberg was uh, the next ship that appeared, and it was a very clever name. We, I think everyone in the Navy was impressed when they looked at this big tanker as a mountain. And this started a system whereby our support ships were Drakensberg. So it's like a class name. And then came the great day when the submarines were ordered. And I wasn't present, but the story goes is that they got these aspirant submarines together and they were, they were being to be told the names. And the person in charge opened the envelope, took one look at it and handed it to his second one and says, you tell them, I'm not going to tell them their names. And thus we, had, we had received three names, Maria van Riebeck, uh, Emily Hobhaus, and Johanna van Amara. Now, somehow with submarines, I think everyone expected more uh, attacking names like Cobra, Adder, and things like that. But anyway, so, but this is the funny thing. They became Houston. They became Maria, Emily, and Johanna. And as happens with sailors, it's their, it's their submarine, their boat. So, and they became very, very attached. And when came 1997, no, 98, 99, uh, the decision was taken to oh, make more appropriate names. And we gave them Asagai, Spear, and Imponto which were now what you would expect. As a guy's a weapon, they're all the same weapon. And all of a sudden, you should have seen the moans from the people who got so used to Johanna. It wasn't Johanna van der Merwe they were missing. I think it was Johanna. So changing a name there maybe was better in a way. It was just rather interesting that Johanna was replaced by Asa guy because that's how she was stabbed 23 times, etc. So good choice of name, maybe. The what you actually have spoke about, however, was the frigates. Now, when we got our new frigates, for some reason, somewhere in the Navy, the decision was taken, let's try and get names from within. And the Navy held a competition on the naming. Oh, sorry, I, I skipped a very important one. We then had the strike craft. And the strike craft came out with numbers and Interesting enough, we also, when we heard their names, the same feeling because they were named after ministers of defense. Now, okay, they ministers, not as pretty as women, but some of them were okay. And I can give you my personal one. I, I commissioned SAS Oswald Piro. Now, if anyone knows South African history, Oswald Piro was... He wasn't a bad guy. He was the Minister of Defense just before the war. And he's the man that, instead of getting us tanks and things like that, insisted on having mule carts and all sorts of things and was against all of that. However, I overcame that when people say, who was Oswald Pirro? I'd say he was an Oxford blue, he had an Oxford blue in boxing because he did. So, but once again, you get attracted to the name. We were lucky when they renamed them. They did a very good choice, 1997, and they chose names of heroes, warriors. And she became, from the minister class, became the warrior class. And amongst them was Jan Smuts, which is the original name of the ship. So one of our strike craft kept its name. The others were all more appropriate names named after people. Oswald Piro became renamed as Rene Sethrin. In fact, the bell is just behind me over here. That's Oswald Piro's original bell. The uh, Rene Sethrin was a World War II exceptional man. Uh, great, great. He got the Gallantry Medal for uh, when his ship was attacked. He went on firing his machine guns until he was wounded and kept on. And he never actually recovered from it. His, his family will tell you he, his war injuries were that bad. And we've still got three of them, of the, the uh, minister class, which became the warrior class. And I can just mention that three of those names have been carried forward with our new inshore patrol vessels. They haven't formally been named yet, okay, still being built, but three of these names will carry on. So this is a tradition as well. The Royal Navy continues names. So we're doing the same here. The, but to get back to the frigates, the decision was taken Let's try, see what names we've got amongst the Navy. 
uh, a competition was started in which people had to name the suggest names for the frigates. You had to make suggestions of a class name and the names. Just to give you an explanation, there's always a class. It can be the town class, in which case the ships are all named after towns, or sometimes it's the name of the first of the class, Carlisle and Salon and all the others. So it's, but it's, it's just a des description of the, the batch. Anyway, so this competition started and funny enough, I had to assist in the running of the competition. I had to write down the rules and things like that. And I was in, also told that I, I asked, can I enter? And I said, yes, I was allowed to enter, but I was only allowed five entries. And so I got my secretary, the young lady, to enter five as well. And by coincidence, um, three of my five were selected to go to the, the final cut of five. And I was very pleased to say that the Valor class, which I suggested, uh, was finally selected. So, however, there was one difference in that I was told that I had to change one name, Delva Wood, because they did not feel it was appropriate on the grounds that it was a disaster. However, I disagree, but I wasn't going to argue. Uh, Delva Wood is one of our most heroic moments. moments. One brigade held back two German divisions for four days. Uh, it doesn't get better than that. However, we, they eventually selected Amatola, Isandruana, Spionkop, and Mendy. And they were based on more than just one thing. They were based on representing various groupings in South Africa. Amatola covered the Kosa side, Isandruana, the Zulu. So it was a, a, a mix. We didn't call them battle class or anything. They were called warrior class because Amatola, there was no battle of Amatola. Amatolas were an area in which there was a number of battles fought over the years, campaigns fought. So, and bravery was shown by all. So it was called the Valor class. Um, and that's how they got their name. I was also very lucky in that we were told to give numbers of old ships from the frigates. Uh, but I felt that 145 was, uh, 150 was the, one of our ships that was sunk, President Kruger. And anyway, the Australians had a similar class, a Miko class, 150. And 157, Australians had another one, which used to be Freystart. So we changed, changed those numbers to 145, 146, which 146, and 148, which made us a group of 145, 6, 7, 8. It made it easier. So that is the background. But there are two stories which I can tell you. Uh, my other job was I used to be the unofficial herald of the Navy, so I was tasked to design the, the badges. But before that, um, I was informed, I received a letter that somebody in the Defence Force, I won't say who, had written to the minister complaining that Amatole was not the correct spelling of it because that they felt that it was Amatholi, A-M-A-T-H-O-L-E. And I really got rather uptight at that. But my informant said, don't worry, it's all in hand. So I sat back. And my informant was the chief of the Navy. And anyway, what subsequently happened was he spoke to the chief of the Defense Force. And at the next command council meeting, the chief of the Defense Force addressed the meeting and said, one of you has just gone over my head to the minister. I take great exception to that. And it suggested that we change something and showed advised the change and apparently he then looked at chief of the navy and said chief of the navy what is your comment on this proposed change and the chief of the navy said sir i don't think any of my sailors would ever like to serve on a ship that's name begins with a and ends with whole and the matter was closed the other thing we did i in the design of the actual badges i put a weapon into each one for example amatola the weapon I used was an axe because of the war of the axe. And it's a normal Western axe. It's not a, because that's how the war started when somebody stole it and they ended up having a, a war over it. Uh, Isangdwana, I used the symbol of the 24th Regiment, which is a Sphinx, because that was what the English troops called it. Said, ah, it's the mountain of the Sphinx. And how they knew this, what the Sphinx looked like was their collar badges, the 24th Regiment, which got massacred. Had the Sphinx on it. 
Uh, when this went to the Herald, it came back and said, no, not approved. He comes from there, he'd like to submit his own. And he had a, a hut as the symbol. And we just went back and pointed out to him that, first of all, his job there is to approve, not to suggest. We want to, it's got to, it's got to link, the actual what's name has got to link with the ship. As I explained to you, you must recognize it. And he gracefully withdrew. So there's a lot of emotion in these things too. If you make a mistake on a badge, it, it gets picked up. And there are quite a few funny ones, badges in the past. So that's how they named them. You did explain to me prior, before we started recording, that in the old days, the sailors couldn't read. And that's how they recognized their ships off through these. Uh, figureheads. Yes. Especially the figurehead. Um, and then they had, when they removed figureheads, the days of sail had gone, they had badges painted on them. And then later in 1918, they standardized them to the current. But a badge must be heraldically representative of the ship. The idea being that you can see and say, oh, that is SAS. That. The interesting thing is the strike craft badges are slightly different. There, because we had nine strike craft, so it started when we had six, uh, we decided that for, for symbolic reasons, we didn't have names at that stage. So we decided we were to use this, the longship, the Viking longship, because we felt that we were longships. In fact, on our delivery voyage, we had a newspaper called The Voyage of the Longship. And it all, and we felt very much like Vikings. And in fact, it turns out by coincidence that we became Vikings, landing troops. Okay, let's not get into that. But we standardized on one badge, which was a, a Viking longship. And if you can see one around me somewhere, there's one over there. In fact, my ship's one, I don't know if you can see it. Um, but each one was depicted with a different colors. And the colors were based on the ship's colors. We all had t-shirts, et cetera, for recreation. And each ship had a color. So our badges were different colors. So you could see it on the badge as well. So another way of seeing the badge and knowing which ship it was, if you were in the Navy, if you were a member. So. It's fascinating tradition. I keep on using that word. But for me, this is really, this is history, which I really enjoy. Thank you for that. But now I must ask, I suppose, a silly question. We have four frigates, and they all look the same. But, sir, are they the same when you're, when you're on there? Yes. <clears throat> they're all built to the same design. Uh, they're all manned to the same levels. They're all commanded by people who have specifically passed. And I know this because if you don't pass the command exam, it's if you don't get command. Uh, for a very good reason. The Navy's got a few billion rands worth of ship out there and you don't want to lose it to an incompetent person or someone who can't fight. So they all run to the same standards, basically. You'll find minor... We've always had that. You'll find happy ships and less happy ships. Uh, we've had this through the years. Ships were known by... And it's all influenced by the captain and first lieutenant. Uh, the, the captain of a ship is referred to as father, and the first lieutenant as mother. Uh, because... The first lieutenant handles the running of the ship's routines. The captain is responsible for the ship, making sure it gets the stuff it needs and fighting it at sea. Whereas the first lieutenant is the man that runs the ship, his mother. He makes sure that the routines run, that the food is cooked, etc. Not personally, but he's got his staff. He's in charge. So there's always a slight difference there. But ships are all basically the, the same anyway. When it comes to fighting, etc., they'll fight the same. The difference, a big number painted on the side, F145, 146, 147, and 148. And when they pass here, if they pass too far out and I can't see the number, I have to think very carefully, or I cheat and I go and look and see what's left in the Navy and I know which one is there. But they're all basically the same. There was an incident where the two, was it? destroyers, uh, this, this is long ago, where they sort of intercepted uh, a U.S. carrier group. I wonder if you can tell us about that, sir, because I've heard it. I'm not sure if it's true. Uh, the Americans refuse to believe it or admit guilt, but perhaps we can make them admit guilt. 
the, the Americans, in fact, complained about it. There was a diplomatic bureau, and one of our people resigned from the Navy as a result of it. So it, it is true. Uh, we're going back now to the, <clears throat> the late 1970s, and two of our strike off. Now, traditionally, when any task group, foreign task, Navy group comes around, even though they're out of our waters, we just advertise our presence and we normally send messages. And even in the good old days, if we bumped into a Royal Navy frigate on Biro Patrol, et cetera, we come close past, pass a bottle of brandy across, a bottle of whiskey back and say hi to each other. Uh, we're fairly friendly. But you always advise, advise them by having your presence here that we, we're here, we know you're here. Shows you we're awake. And in this case, we, an American nuclear task force, a carrier and two nuclear cruisers was coming around the Cape and we sailed B-1561 and 1563. Two of our, our two, two of our first strike craft to go and we use the word intercept and escort, accompany them. When they, when they went down, the weather was pretty lousy and there was a heavy sea running. And I mentioned earlier, we're very keen on electronic warfare. The Israelis gave us the importance of it. So the ships went down silently. They did not use their radar. And what added them was that the American ships did have radar, navigation radar. So we knew roughly where they were. And as they approached closer, we were in the troughs of the sea, so they couldn't even pick us up on their radar. And then all of a sudden, when we were close, we switched on radar, sped up, and they both did a turn towards. But unfortunately, in one case, there was a slight underestimation of the power of the sea, etc., and the ship came in. Uh, when I say close, do, please do not think of it two meters or three meters. It was 60 meters, 50 meters, whatever it is, away from the ship. And in fact, one of the officers on board had a beautiful cartoon showing this American aircraft carrier with people flying kites looking down. And the bottom showed you this little strike rock rolling over with people holding onto the side, et cetera, there and bouncing over the waves. Very true. But the Americans did complain and said it was bad seamanship, et cetera. It wasn't. They, it was an accident, but it was under control. And we yes, said goodbye to them at the border. And of course, when we came back, there was a lot of inquiries, et cetera. And I don't know if it's because of this, but one of the OCs then left the Navy, but he came back. He came back and did very well, became an admiral. He was too good to lose anyway. So. Yes, I've heard about that story. They had quite a fright actually when those two vessels just popped up because they were within I, missile range. They could have caused damage. I think they were embarrassed. Oh, well within missile range. I think that it was embarrassment to anyway. Now, it's interesting because uh, the, the last, the previous time we interacted with a, a flat top was in about 1965, I think, 64, 65, when the Americans sent a task force around and we sent out our, I think it was Jan, Jan van Riebeck, Jan van Riebeck, a newly commissioned helicopter carrier. She carried two wasps on her deck, on her flight deck, in the hangar. And the idea was that our chief of the Navy was on board. He was in a rear admiral in one, and he was going to be picked up and taken across to meet the American admiral there. However, out at sea, the weather, flying conditions, and the helicopter, <laughs> the aircraft carrier said, sorry, we cannot fly in these conditions, so we have to cancel this meeting. So the South African Navy went back and said, well, you know, would you allow one of our helicopters land on deck? And I said, yes. And this little wasp took off. Went and landed on the deck, chief of the Navy met, etc. And they were most impressed. They, they couldn't fly in that weather. We were flying from a little destroyer, World War II destroyer. So um, I think we, we ensured that they had a certain amount of respect for us. Yeah, that's damn good, sailors. But I must ask you a technical question. Would uh... oh, the pilots were Air Force? The pilots were Air Force. Are they just dead okay. Air Force? Well, we like the Air Force as well. I know we'll uh, say something bad about the blue jobs. I invite all of them to come and talk to us anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Would the nuclear-powered vessel be allowed in South African harbors? 
Yes. We've had a few. The uh, Initially, there was a... The new government was not very happy. And in fact, the Navy applied for an American visit. And it was turned down on the grounds that uh, Nuclear Free Africa, and funny enough, the chap I mentioned, Steve Stead and I were both involved in this one. We're going to be interviewing, I hope. Uh, and we put out the point that the nuclear power is allowed in Africa because Egypt hosts nuclear carriers, et cetera, and it's going to do the weapons. In fact, the chances are that the destroyer coming in will have a nuclear torpedo or something, is, and they'll never have to declare it. So just because it's a nuclear powered vessel, Anyway, um, the, well, by the time came, we had a, a visit by the Dreadnought uh, and followed by a number of others. Uh, I've got their badges here. I went on board all of them. And then also the uh, Los, uh, Sun One, which is an American Los Angeles class. And that was a particularly interesting visit because she came out to exercise and she exercised with two of our submarines, then came in and then went out again to exercise again, and I wrote an article. I was then, I retired and I was called up as editor of Naval News. And I went on board and I wrote an article. And when I spoke to the captain, he basically said to me, he said, you know, we had people on your boats and you had people here. Uh, we never caught it. We never caught a smell of your boats. The worst thing is my people came back and told us you were holding on to us all the time. Um, so nuclear is a, a great advantage in certain aspects. And he said to me, you know, I don't understand it because we're as quiet as we can be. And I said, well, I've got news for you. You can't move 9,000 tons underwater without moving water. And all our boats do is they just stop and point you. <laughs> so he conceded. So nuclear power merely gives them uninterrupted underwater capability and range. But it means big and big will automatically. You can make them as quiet as you can. And there are various ways of doing it, acoustic tiles, etc. But the sheer fact that you're moving water. We've had about four or five. And then, of course, we've also had the uh, Roosevelt. Yes, it's Roosevelt. She came in some years, also about 10 years, no, 15 years ago. Mm, 10 years ago. Uh, to Cape Town. Of course, they are too big to come into harbors. Uh, most of our harbors uh, we probably can go in alongside container walls, etc. but you, you can't take up all that space. It's a, it's a commercial thing. So they prefer anchoring in the bay. But yes, we have a very good uh, agency for clearing it. And the British, when they came down, the second ship submarine, when they brought it down here, they the Nuclear Energy Board, the people doing it, licensing, whatever it is, came to see us. And they took one look at our organization. I mean, Simonstown has always had nu nuclear evacuation plans and things. We showed them where we were going to have guards. We showed them the boats, et cetera. They just went through it and signed on the spot. So the Navy knows what, how to do it. Navies all over the world do it. When such a ship approach any type of war vessel, would the Navy go out and meet it? or track it or something, or just it does come in like a normal ship? No, we know, we know where they are. We, we see them coming. We know they're coming. Uh, just an interesting aside, um, today, but right now, I believe, they're busy launching a maritime domain awareness satellite made in Cape Town here. It's part of a series. I think they want nine. So we've now got, this will be the third one. So we're going to have a maritime domain capability here, which is world class. It'll be almost in time, on time. And it will be tracking between these nine satellites. They'll be tracking any movement in the area. We'll know exactly what ships are here. There's no reason to go out and meet them. If it is a hostile ship or a ship that does not have notifying us, then we'll send a ship maybe to a company. We do that. As you know, so I'm here in Switzerland, which is far away from the, from the ocean. But they do have actually a motion fleet where we're used to. Funny yeah. enough. And they were not bad sailors. Now, France is just a cross it's that way, not far. And the French are very angry at the moment with Australians because of a submarine. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you 
I have to ask your opinion. Do you think it's wise for Australia now to get there, to go from the diesel electric acquired ones to noisy <laughs> nuclear? I mean, because once you go nuclear, you're being, you actually become a attacking nation. Nuclear submarines are not built for your own shores. They're not for defensive, they're offensive weapons. And obviously against China. Now, the Chinese Navy, they are building so many warships that they ran out of names. They, they can't name these things anymore. They're bigger than the US Navy right now. But may I ask your opinion, sir? What, what do you think of that? Okay. Very emotional. The Australians have got a massive area. And it's an area that's been fed. In the Second World War, bombs were dropped on Darwin. Japanese occupied New Guinea. They sweated. Now, first of all, I'd like to uh, not attack, but to answer your statement that nuclear submarines are not defensive. Depends on how you look at it. There are two types of nuclear submarines. In fact, there's three, but don't worry about the other. You get the SSN, which is a nuclear submarine attack. Then you get an SSBN, which is without any doubt, purely offensive. And her job is to lie somewhere where no one sees her and then to fire whatever missiles are in vogue at the time, it used to be Polaris, it's now Trident, and obliterate the other country. Now, for every nuclear ballistic missile, the ideal would be to have one nuclear attack submarine which will follow her and track her. And these are, are um, attack boats are designed to sink other ships or what's the name, but they're not the purely offensive. They are to do that to defend. So to stop a ballistic missile submarine, probably you'll have him trailed by one of these things. So there is a reason. But the nuclear side, as I mentioned earlier, has nothing to do with sound, etc. The diesel electric submarines, the Collins class are probably pretty quiet. The advantage of it, it gives you range and it gives you something I didn't mention, speed. Now, Australia is a massive continent. To sail one of their Collins class submarines around their continent is an almost impossible task, and it'll go at eight knots. A nuclear submarine has got legs. She can get, any, she got six months to get anywhere. She can get around that continent at a speed of 25 knots. So, and she can get to a scene where she has to be pretty fast. So, it was an obvious step that they had to get nuclear submarines. To me, sorry. Now, I've got friends who live there who say, no, they've got a nuclear-free policy. Because when they chose the Barracuda design, which is a French nuclear submarine, which was adapted, made smaller, to be non-nuclear, I still questioned and said, what? and when I heard the value of these things, the cost of these things, I said, why not get nuclear submarines? I was told, no. Now, all of a sudden, it all changed. And of course, that should be rather irksome for the French because I reckon uh, they might have been able to sell them nuclears. India is looking at them now. But of course, the French have got limited capability to build. On the other hand, so is the Americans. They build two a year. So Australia is not going to get nuclear submarines for the next 20 years. I'm willing to put a wager on it. So they're going to have to now have intermediate class. Uh, they're even looking, someone suggests they look at second-hand Japanese submarines, which, by the way, if they were going to go for a, a standard diesel electric, I would always have said go for the Japanese. They build the most, the best diesel electric type submarines at the moment in that they use very special batteries. The rest of the world still following them. The Japanese have got very good, good submarines. So, yes, Australia does need some ability probably this would, if they get it, be a good answer for covering their coast. And don't forget, submarines can be used for, uh, the third one I mentioned is the new cruise missile, where they've got a, a land attack, but not a nuclear attack. So it's a nuclear submarine that can fire cruise missiles. Tomahawks, they've had for some time, which can be used against ships or against land targets. So I think they went around, but the Australians are very funny that way. No nuclear, now all of a sudden it's gone. I think the sudden shock of it must have upset the French. I doubt if it anything else. Though, to be honest, 
they, they were dragging their heels. There was a lot of funny stuff going on, which none of us would be aware of. But the price was going up, and they were seeing no progress. So, say like well, that. That's why we have the experts here. So I really enjoy this answer. I'm not an expert on that. I just read a lot. Well, your opinion counts more than mine, sir. And there's a lot of Australians watching the show, strangely enough. But now there's another thing I have to ask you. It seems that US submarines, and I know this for sure, as well as other weapons uh, systems, aircraft carriers, do have tactical nuclear bombs on board. And they are, of course, capable of shooting these things, otherwise they wouldn't have it. Do you think it's perhaps too much of a responsibility on the commander or not? Well, I can ask that in another way. I don't think they do have tactical nuclear weapons personally. Um, the, they're very careful about what they, what they carry. Uh, they used to carry nuclear weapons, but those days have changed. And I'm not so sure they they do. They the nuclear if the, if it is known they were carrying it makes them a target. It's a, a really special target, just like an SSBN is a target. But I think that the nu the, the safety policy for all nuclear weapons, and when you say tactical nuclear weapons, even they would have to have a very limited capability. On the other hand, the Russians do carry nuclear torpedoes and things like that. And they're looking at that. I can't say the Americans don't have those, but those are not, those are made for underwater explosions, which are, are less. So I'm afraid in this case, I am not a great expert. Um, you've, you've been a naval officer all your life. Now I recall when I was very young, I think it was in the seventies, the chief of the defense force was actually an admiral, I think. I know. Admiral, admiral H. H. Biermann. Biermann, that's, that's right. 1972 to 1975. Which, of course, I was all of five, six years old, so I, I still remember because I was thinking, why is the sailor in charge here? Why not the army general? And now I have to ask you, do you think in modern warfare, but it's perhaps better to have a sailor in charge because he's more technically minded than no. a pongo. No. It could be anyone. At that stage, you're in charge of three services. You have to know all the three services. You've got your specialists in every field. The British system, we used to be, I think it was rule, I can't remember it, but they were quite strict. The Navy replaced, was replaced by an Air Force. He was replaced by Army. And it was a turn. Unfortunately, they had a hiccup when, funny enough, when I was there, and all of a sudden this changed and they stopped that. And they now choose the most suitable person. But it's, we don't require that. You know, many years ago, um, I remember this well, when we got a new chief of the Navy, someone said he's never been to sea. And I said to the person, yes. In this case, I said, almost thank God because he's going to be chief of the Navy. We've got a flag officer fleet down here who runs the Navy. That man up there has got to get money for the Navy. He's going to get training places for the Navy. He's got to organize. So at that level, your naval expertise is useful, but not a major requirement. In fact, your political expertise and being able to dance in a minefield of budgets, et cetera, is more important. And having up there was good for us because he did look after the Navy, but Pirman was an amazing person. He, he got an OBE for his work in the Second World War. He was made chief of the Navy as a commander. He was made an acting captain, temporary uh, commodore. And he was chief of the Navy. But I joined the Navy. He'd been chief of the Navy for about 10 years at that stage. And he went on to be chief of the Navy for another 10, or another five or six. Um, so, yes, he was very capable. He replaced an Air Force man, Kim Strong. So, but towards the end, it became obvious that you were going to be chief of the Defense Force if you were in the Army. The border war dictated that almost. Uh, once again, I don't think it needed it, but it did. 
But that, yeah, I've got a question for you because I know this frigate of ours has a strange power drive. I mean, they have like um, propellers as well as, um, or screws, what do you call it, as well as water jets. So right. let me ask you a question of that quickly because I found that fascinating. These new frigates of us, I understand, have two propulsion systems. I wonder if you can tell us a bit about that because one is water and the other, I believe the other one is, a, so we call it a screw, right? Standard, standard propulsion. Yeah. Okay. So, the, the ships basically have diesel engines, which can be connected via gearboxes to other the propellers. So you can use one to drive two propellers, two to drive one each. And that is normally your cruising alternative. However, we've also got an LM2500, which is a highly, <laughs> highly used and very experienced. It's been around for 20, 30 years. American gas turbine. And this drives water jets. And so water jets at the back. And so you've got the advantage that when you want high speed, you go to the water jets to give you speed and also instant stopping power because it's got a bucket system which stops you within about three ships length. You'll fall over if you're not holding onto something. But also in anti-submarine work, it, it makes less noise. So it, it helps you get closer. But they, they're two separate systems and you basically use them according to your requirement. One is economical, the gas turbines, chow fuel. That's, that's, so that, that's my knowledge. So it's the best of both worlds. It all depends on what application. It is. There are not many using this mix. There's also the different mixes, gas turbines, driving propellers. But that's what we have. But they don't use the same fuel. Yes, they use diesel. Even for the gas? Um... No. Gas is an American term for petrol, too. That's yes, of course. It's I recall when Hitler and Mates got very uh, upset when they heard about the gas in the UK. Yeah. They thought they were going to be... Um... Can these uh, vessels, are they in any way armored? If, if they would do anti-piracy duties and they start shooting at them? No, armor plating is weight, uh, and also it's it's expensive. They don't need this in certain places. I don't doubt they'll have uh, Kevlar type armor things, etc., to protect people, etc. But armor, as in the uh, old armored vessels, no way. Those days are gone. Admiral, we came to the end of the session. I wish to thank you for many hours we spent together. The things you taught us about the Navy, it's one of the services which I personally admire very much. And to all of you out here, thank you for your support. Thank you for all your comments and questions. We are grateful to you. I understand there's a good chance that we can speak to the submarine commander, one of the very best. We'll do so in future episodes. And if there's any other naval person out here, once they speak to me, you're welcome. Just contact me. Until we meet again, God bless.